morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mayor Dunbar, and uh, the presence. I, I'm always uh, honored and touched uh, to be in the company of fellow veterans, uh, men and women who wore their uniform decades before I did, at the same time that I did, and after I did, and younger men and women who haven't taken the oath of service yet or put on the nation's uniform, but who express their intention to do that. It's truly an honor to be here today in front of all of you as we recognize the 100th anniversary of the great armistice and the allied victory of World War I and the creation of this beautiful chapel. You know, as Fred mentioned in his address, this chapel was erected between 1917 and 1918, and the first services were offered that second November the same month, the world called for a ceasefire in Europe after four and a half years of terrible fighting. And when that armistice was signed, there was great hope, hope that it would mark the end of war, at least the end of war on a multinational scale. And of course, unfortunately, that hope turned out to be false. The Greek philosopher Plato is credited with saying that Unfortunately, only the dead have seen the end of war, and therefore young men and women will continue to need to join the military to defend our rights, and some of them will return, and some will not. And those who do not return will in turn be remembered on days like this with a momentary silence and a simple red poppy lapel. The common corn poppy known as Papaver Roas grows throughout the United States, Asia, Africa, and Europe, and is native to the Mediterranean region. Its seeds require light to grow, so when those seeds are buried deep in the earth, they can lay dormant with no light for up to 80 years without blooming. But once that soil is disturbed and those seeds come to see light, poppies that no one knew existed bloom again. And during World War I, this phenomenon took place on a huge scale in Belgium, the home of the Western Front in its Flanders provinces. As thousands of soldiers marched those fields, the soil was churned up for miles, pocketed by bombs, disturbed by trenches and artillery fire. <clears throat> the Battle of Ypres, which took place in a portion of Flanders known as Flanders Fields, was particularly deadly. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers died on those fields due to the mechanics of that war. And it was then following the second battle of Ypres a year later that a young Canadian doctor named John McCrae noticed the glow of red poppies near one of the field's mass cemeteries. Through that death and deadly destruction grew something anew, stained red and in, in a botanical analogy where the science of botany sort of meets the poetry of war, the poppies grew stained like blood, symbolizing much of what we've come to know about the detriments of war. And then in 1915, McCrae wrote a title of a poem that you will all hear read shortly, titled In Flanders Fields, whose opening lines run in Flanders Fields, the poppies grow between the crosses row on row. That has become the most popular and most recognized war poem throughout the United States and in Great Britain. But before we disperse, let's hear from one of our residents here, Mickey Gandel, as he reads the entirety of Dr. McCrae's poem, In Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely fly by scarce, but scarce heard mid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders Field. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands, 
we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye be break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields.